Um, so we have a very large group um, that makes all of our work po uh, possible, so I just wanted to quickly acknowledge them. Um, in terms of the presentation, I'm going to very briefly go over the social deficits that are commonly seen in individuals with ASC, um, as well as the consequences of some of these social challenges, so how it impacts our day-to-day -day functioning. Uh, from there, I'm going to talk about the PEERS method, which is the social skills intervention program that we use, um, and it was developed at UCLA. Um, and then I'll be talking about our three groups. So we have a preschooler group, an adolescent group, and a young adult group. Um, and then from there, I'm going to wrap up by talking about the research that we've conducted, looking specifically at adolescents with ASD. And then for those of you um, clinicians who are um, in the audience, really focusing on some resources that might be of interest to you. Um, so let's start off by just talking about some of the social deficits that are commonly seen in adolescents and youth with ASD. And so overall what we see is that these children tend to um, have or make fewer social initiations, meaning they are entering um, peer interactions um, less frequently or even initiating those uh, play interactions. Um, when they do, um, when they are involved in play interactions, they tend to engage more in parallel play, meaning they're playing next to each other, not really interacting much. And we see this even in our adolescent groups and in our young adults um, as well. So it's something that stays with them over the course of the lifespan. Um, at, and overall, they tend to have less interactive play and less imaginative play. Um, we see that they tend to exhibit uh, poor social motivation, meaning that they're less engaged with peers um, their age, they're seeking out the, uh, the peer contact less frequently. Um, and they also seem to have poor social awareness, meaning they have difficulty understanding social cues. So um, being able to pick up on verbal and nonverbal signs that maybe their friends aren't interested in talking about Pokemon for the fifth time over and over again, or knowing that if somebody's looking away and yawning, that it might be a sign of disinterest. So they have difficulty picking up on those cues. Um, they tend to have poor social communication, meaning that they have difficulty initiating and sustaining reciprocal social conversations. So not only beginning conversations, but being able to talk about things that are of shared interests with their partner, um, being able to draw in other people by asking questions, elaborating on the other person's statements. And we also see poor social cognition. So this is an overall um, difficulty understanding the perspectives of others. So what another person might feel like, what they might be thinking, and being able to integrate that into their interactions. Now the consequences of um, these social deficits um, are actually quite pervasive and persistent across development. And what we know is that despite the cognitive functioning of individuals with ASD and despite their language abilities, we do see um, broad challenges in their social functioning. And what we also know is that these social challenges, they um, they worsen as social demands and expectations increase with age. And so it's really important that we're providing them with appropriate skills as they go through their uh, different developmental um, periods. Consequences of these social challenges are that they're often um, rejected by their peers. Um, and this means they're, they're actively rejected. So they're trying to initiate. Um, they might be trying to join conversations with people, but they're, act, they're, they're being actively pushed away. Um, some of them are overlooked, so they're, so they're socially neglected. So these may be the teens or the young children that maybe are on the periphery of the playground, periphery of the lunch area. Um, they're not being actively rejected by their peers, but they're not being sought out as well. Um, as a result, they tend to have um, fewer reciprocal friendships. And what we also know is that they tend to um, report increased loneliness and increased feelings of isolation. Now, this came out of a study that was conducted back in 2000 by um, Dr. Kazri, um, um, who really looked at the quality of these relationships. Um, and we oftentimes, in the past, I think we assumed that individuals with ASD or kids with ASD enjoyed being by themselves. Right, that they were seeking that solitude. Uh, but it, what it turns out is they were actually able to report and describe feeling significant loneliness um, in light of all their social challenges. We see that these uh, children and teens, they are at higher risk for developing comorbid mood and anxiety symptoms. So they tend to have um, anxi anxiety disorders, um, depressed mood because of the social challenges and that they not only experience academic problems um, 
during childhood and adolescence, but this continues into um, difficulties with, with employment later on. Uh, there are a lot of different types of interventions out there for uh, youth with ASD. Um, and when we're looking specifically um, at social skills inter intervention, there tends to be a greater focus on early intervention. And early intervention is um, a great area to be working in because we know that if we intervene earlier, our hope is to be able to put our children on a different trajectory in terms of their development. However, even with this focus on early intervention programs, there um, isn't a specific focus within these programs on teaching social skills. So broadly, oftentimes they're targeting language development, for example, or targeting behavior management, flexibility, and not specific social skills. Um, and what we know also of other existing social skills treatments is that, is that they aren't tailored for individuals with ASD who don't have an intellectual disability. Now it's important to think about this group. I think oftentimes they're overlooked because cognitively they're functioning comparable to their peers, but we see them struggling um, if you, you know, see them in the playground, if you see them at lunch. Um, and oftentimes they face different social challenges. So there's a greater push for inclusion greater push to put these students in a mainstream classroom, but we're not giving them the right supports to be able to interact with their peers in that inclusive setting. Um, there are overall few treatments for teens and adolescents because there is such a focus on the early, um, the early years, and most programs do not include um, a parent in, as an active part of treatment or teachers. Now teachers are seeing the children for many hours during the day and then parents um, are there oftentimes um, to be able to follow through with that coaching but most programs don't uh, incorporate teachers and parents. So it's something that we are very passionate about um, in, um, in the peers program. And um, overall we see uh, generally a limited generalization of treatment gains um, over time, um, as well as across various treatment settings. So with many existing social skills interventions, we'll see them being able to demonstrate the skill during the group, during the 12, 13, 14 weeks of treatment, but we're not seeing them being able to maintain those skills outside of the treatment setting or outside of the treatment or the course of treatment um, and be able to use that you know, with their peers and being able to develop meaningful relationships. Um, and when we look at various social skills interventions. Um, there are a lot of different types of social skills. So you can focus on conversation skills, you can focus on grooming, table manners, eating. Um, and so it's really important that there are specific programs focused on friendship development. Now there are various evidence-based methods of social skills instruction, and these are the methods that we use in the PEERS program. So as we go through these different methods, I'll talk about how we incorporate them in our program. Um, so it's really important to have a small group format. I know sometimes um, social skills is taught one-on-one, um, -on -one, and in certain scenarios that may be more appropriate. If, if, for example, the adolescent needs more repetition of instruction, perhaps if there's um, an intellectual disability that might be interfering or that might make it difficult for them to be in a group setting. If you have other teens that maybe are not cognitively delayed, you might use a one-on-one -on -one setting. But generally, you want to have a small group format so they can practice the skills with each other. And as much as possible, this offers a setting where they can practice the skills in a naturalistic way. So in our group, we start off all of our groups with about 10 adolescents, um, about 10 to 11, same for our um, teen, young adult, and our preschooler groups. Okay. And it's really important to have um, structured didactic lessons. So there are a lot of different groups out there, and some of them are social recreational groups, meaning they're not teaching specific skills each week, um, but what they're doing is it's, you know, having children come together or teens come together to play games and activities or they host outings, um, and that's great, but they're not teaching them um, specific skills to be using in those settings. And so it's really important that we teach concrete rules um, and steps of social etiquette. So what to do if your goal, for example, is to join a conversation with somebody? How do you do that? If you want to have a get together, you want to invite, um, invite somebody to hang out, how do you do that? We go over um, these concrete rules and steps, and our goal is to provide our families with a roadmap. So if you're in this situation, this is what you can do, and these are the four or five steps to be able to accomplish that goal. Okay. 
And we focus on ecologically valid skills, uh, meaning not what we as adults, as treatment providers, want teens, children, young adults to be doing, but really what their peers are naturally doing on their own to be uh, making and keeping friends. So we pulled from the research to see how other teens are initiating conversations. We're breaking down those skills and, uh, and sharing them with the families. Um, and with the ecologically valid skills, we, uh, we target do's and don'ts, meaning what um, should we not be doing as well as what, should we, what we should be doing instead. Um, now, after the lesson, um, it's really important to also have um, our families practice. And so we'll have the teens, children, and young adults, um, so our first we'll model the skill. And so we do this through role play demonstration. So the group leader and we ha also have behavioral coaches who are oftentimes graduate students, um, college students. They'll actually model the behavior that we're um, hoping to teach. Um, now, they also demonstrate the inappropriate behavior. And there's oftentimes been a, been a discussion of not modeling the inappropriate behavior because we don't want to be encouraging um, our teens and young adults to be doing the inappropriate behavior. You're right. So the way that we do this is we start off by showing an inappropriate role play and we use that as a teaching opportunity. So we never tell our teens, if you want to join a conversation, this is how you do it. We'll have our coaches, for example, role play what not to do, so that's the inappropriate role play. And then we'll have our teens, young adults, then generate what they should be doing instead based on those errors. So that's really using a Socratic method. And I'll talk, and I'll show you guys how we do that through our groups. So you wanna do an inappropriate role play um, and also utilize an appropriate role play. And after that, we have our teens or young adults practice the skills. And as they're practicing with each other, we're providing them performance feedback in the moment. So we're giving them little tips, um, feedback on how they might want to use the skills in the future. Okay. And we also provide homework assignments each week, meaning we provide several assignments for our teens and young adults to be practicing the skills during the week in their naturalistic setting, whether it's at school, at work, in whatever social group or extracurricular activity that they're in. Um, and then we also have a, a very big component um, in terms of parent social coaching. So parents are actively involved um, throughout the entire program. They come each week and they're involved for um, the entire session. Uh, some brief background around peers. Um, it is a program that has been used internationally, so it's been translated into, into six languages. It's been used in over a dozen countries. Um, the NICE um, identified it as a best example of an evidence-based social skills intervention for youth with ASD. Um, and a recent Cochrane report said it, it was one of five evidence-based social skills interventions for youth who um, that can actually be um, Obtain. So there are a lot of evidence-based programs out there, but you're not able to access them because they're used primarily for research. So it's really important that we're able to then um, provide or give families and uh, treatment providers access to these types of evidence-based interventions. Um, and it is evidence-based for our adolescent and young adult group, and we're starting to collect data on our preschooler group. So for our preschooler group, um, this is a 16-week manualized social skills intervention. And at this point, um, we are um, offering this group to children between the ages of four to six years with ASD who do not have an intellectual disability. And the way that we teach the lessons is we actually have a live puppet show each week where we have puppets role play the skills with each other. And then the kids will come up and practice the skills with the puppet. So it's a lot of repetition of instruction. And then we set up um, two two activities where the children will practice that skill. And they're activities that most children will see in their preschool or kindergarten setting, like red light, green light, what time is it, Mr. Fox, Red Rover, Mother May I, but we adapt the, the game each week to focus on that specific skill. Um, we teach ecologically valid friendship skills, and I'll show you which skills those are. Um, and it's a parent-assisted intervention. So while the children are in one room, we have parents down the hall in a separate room um, talking to us about how, they, how the children did and using the skills during the week. Um, and we really focus on uh, really basic behavior management strategies so that parents can be applying those to the play dates that the children are having during the week. And parents are acting as social coaches both during sessions and outside of sessions. So the last, for the first hour of the group, 
um, the parents and children are separated, each learning their own lesson. But the last 20 to 30 minutes of the group, we actually reunify the families and we set up mock play dates. So this is where we assign two kids to play with each other. They'll bring a board game or some kind of structured activity from home. We'll have the parents social coach their children on that specific skill. And at the same time, we have our treatment team um, standing behind the parent, whispering in the parent's ears, and giving them coaching on their social coaching. So it's a, it's a trickle-down approach that we're using. We're really taking advantage of this parent training model. In terms of the curriculum, these are all the skills that we address. Um, the skill in white joining a game is a, is a clinical example that I'll be showing you. But as you see, we'll go over fall, listening and following directions. And the reason why we start off with this lesson is even though most of our children are able to do this quite well, um, it's um, actually, um, it can be drawing that first day of groups for a lot of our, our kids. And so it's just a nice way to orient them to the structure of the program. And then from there, we talk about greeting friends, meeting and greeting friends, so saying hi, um, how do you ask for names. We talk about um, how to play with our peers by sharing and giving a churn, asking for a churn, um, but also keeping cool. So we can follow all the right skills, but our friends might still say no if we ask for a churn. So it's really important that our, our kids know how to keep cool in the moment, and what else can they do? They can keep on playing, or they can choose to find another game. Uh, we talk about how to be a good sport, um, how to show and tell during play. This is a great way to increase reciprocity during the play, during the play interaction, so it's not um, so much a parallel play interaction. Uh, and we also go over how to ask a friend to play, um, how to join an ongoing game. So if you see you know, a group of friends playing, how can you join that game? The, rule, the skills are slightly different there. Um, as well as how to play something different, which really means if you get bored playing with your friends and you want to play a new activity, instead of just walking away, um, how do you introduce or how do you suggest playing a new activity to your peers? Um, and then from there, we talk about how to help friends, maintaining appropriate body boundaries, um, and how to use an inside voice so we're not talking too loudly or too quietly. Um, for the study, we, had, we just completed an RCT. We did um, have using polite words as a lesson, but we actually replaced that for our current clinical groups, and we've replaced that with don't be bossy, meaning how to be more cooperative. We've learned that from our study that our, our, our kids need a little bit more help being more cooperative, not being so self-directed during play in terms of telling their friends what to do and how to do it. All right, so this is um, the format that we use in teaching the skills. And so for all the skills, we use very short buzzwords or buzz phrases to highlight the main components of each skill. So we tell our kids, you know, if you want to join a game, so if you see your friends playing ball, for example, and you want to join, you say you first have to watch the game, right? So you have to watch the game, um, and you have to figure out what they're playing and determine if you know the rules. You can't just barge in because you want to play. Um, and we say, actually, if you don't know the rules, you kind of have to just wait and see if you can pick up the rules, or at that point, find another activity to play. Okay. Um, if you do know the rules, we say you can then move a little bit closer, and then you can ask to play. And the way you ask to play is by looking at your friend, smiling at your friend, you know, saying, can I play using names? And these are repetitive themes throughout their program is to look at your friends with their eyes, smile with your mouth, it's really important to use names. And then we say, if your friend says yes, great, join the game. But if your friends say no, then you keep your cool. It's a, it was a previously taught skill. And then you find something else to do. Okay, so let me go over the results for um, our open trial. We're still analyzing our results from our randomized control trial. So when we were looking at their scores, their severity scores on the ADOS, um, what we see pre is on the left side and post is on the right side. We see that um, our children, they're moving from a moderate range of impairment or severity to um, a low range. Um, and for our um, randomized control, we had a smaller group just because we wanted to make sure that the intervention and curriculum was feasible, and so we had a group of five at that time. And so we were underpowered, but we're seeing a nice trend. And our initial analyses of our randomized control trial, we're seeing the same results, so it's very encouraging to see. In regards to the um, social responsiveness scale, which is a parent questionnaire, um, and it looks at um, uh, their, um, 
their social communicative behaviors across several domains. So we're looking at overall social communication impairments, um, and then we look at social awareness, social cognition, social communication, motivation, um, and then repetitive behaviors and restricted interests. And for this, um, higher scores indicate more impairment. So we want to see scores go down from pre to post treatment. And so pre is the dark blue, um, and then post is the light blue. Um, and so we see at pre, um, they are pretty much in the moderate range across the domains. And at post, we see them go down to the mild range or even below the mild range. So they're in the average range in regards to um, how interfering those social communication impairments are. We also administered uh, the social skills um, improvement scale, and this taps into overall social skills as well as overall problem behaviors as reported by parents. And here, higher scores indicate better social skills. And so we see at pre, um, which is the darker blue, that they are below the average range at pre, um, but at post-treatment, so after 16 weeks of intervention, um, we see them um, fall into the average range. Now, intervention for our preschooler group, as well as other groups, is once a week for 90 minutes. So it's not a lot of intervention, right? It's really the parents who are learning to be effective social coaches, who are coaching the children during the week so that we can see these types of meaningful gains. Um, and then on the right side, those are the subscales of the SSIS when it gets to the social domain. And here, again, we want to see um, higher scores because higher scores indicate improved social skills. And across all the subdomains, in terms of communication, cooperation, assertion, responsibility, empathy, engagement, self-control, we're seeing slight improvements. So again, this is just with a, a, you know, a group of five, but we're seeing um, good you know, changes moving in the right direction. And the social skill, the SSIS, also looks at problem behaviors. And again, dark blue is before treatment, light blue is after treatment. Now, they're, they're in the average range um, at pre-post, but what we're seeing is that they're decreasing in their problem behaviors. Right? And then we're seeing the same trend when it comes to um, the subscales, which is externalizing behavior, internalizing behaviors. Bullying is going up a little bit. Um, that means they're bullying their peers. But I wonder if it might be a consequence of being more assertive um, in a way. So we'll need to look at that a little bit more. Um, and we're seeing de decreased hyperactivity and decreased ASD-like symptoms. Now, we also looked at level of overall social engagement, and this is a measure that was developed in our clinic and we've been using in all of our various studies, which is a quality of play questionnaire. So this is where we have parents identify how many play dates they've had um, that they were hosting, that they were hosting themselves, and how many play dates they had that they were invited to. So this is really getting at that reciprocity. So we see that um, on the very left side, that's overall number of get-togethers or play dates, that before treatment, um, they were having a little bit less than two play dates. After treatment, they were having about three and a half. Um, and in terms of specifically hosting and um, attending a get-together, they were hosting less than one play date, um, but then they were having almost two play dates um, that they were hosting. Um, at the end of treatment, and um, in terms of being invited as a guest to a play date, um, that stayed around the one to two. And this is within a month, right? So the number of play, uh, play dates they're having in a month. So moving along to our adolescent program, um, this is also a parent-assisted program. This one meets for 14 weeks. Um, and again, it's 90-minute weekly um, intervention, and we have concurrent parent and teen sessions. So the teens are in one room, and we have all the parents down the hall in the separate room. Um, and this one also has a, a published Korean manual, which I'll talk about the, the research around that for a little bit. In a, in a little bit. And there's also a school version of this, which recently came out and it is again based on research. Um, for the school version, it's a teacher facilitated model and it's a 16 week long curriculum. For this one, parents aren't involved, but there is a um, very comprehensive parent handout. And the way that this is um, laid out is that it's daily lessons um, that could be scheduled between somewhere between 30 to 50 uh, minutes, depending on this, the class schedule. And the, the um, teachers will spend like the first day reviewing this, their practice during the week, second day going over the skills and practicing with each other through the role play demonstrations and then having the kids practice together. So it's laid out quite nicely. 
Now with peers, we focus specifically on friendship skills. So, you know, how to identify um, appropriate friends, where we can meet them, how to get to know them better, and we'll, we also go over strategies related to handling peer conflict and rejection. Um, so some of our teens unfortunately come into our program having experienced significant peer rejection, um, peer neglect, or um, as they become more socially engaged, you know, um, they experience some um, um, teasing. It happens to all of us. So it's really important that we teach, um, that we share those skills with our teens. And again, we focus on ecologically valid skills. So for our teen and adolescent group, um, these are the friendship skills that we focus on. So we talk about where to find appropriate friends and how to um, identify or start to assess whether or not these friends are appropriate. Um, so we know when you're younger, your parents kind of dictate who your playmates are, right? What we want to do is to help our teens and young adults really develop um, a, uh, their own independent ability to assess the quality of those friendships. And we're really looking at reciprocity of friendships, not just me reaching out to my friends, but also friends reaching back out to me. Something that we're constantly focusing on in the groups. From there, um, we talk about, and, and when it comes to choosing friends, we also go over the importance of common interests. I mean, that's really, you know, interests that are mutually shared between you and your friends, because those common interests are the foundation of friendships. So I want you to think about your friendships. Um, I'm assuming that probably your stronger friendships are those friendships where you have more common interests, because you have more things to do together, more things to talk about, in addition just to overall compatibility. So we do focus on common interests with our teens and young adults. From there, we talk about conversation skills, how to trade information in a very reciprocal way so we're not taking over the conversation, we're not monopolizing the conversation, but also to avoid being too passive. Um, so we talk about asking follow-up questions, open-ended questions. We talk to our teens about not um, being a conversation hog. We talk to them, our teens and adults, about not being a policer during conversations. And those are our teens that maybe point out errors that their friends make or say you can do this or that's not right or you shouldn't do that. They're constantly correcting their friends. Um, nobody likes to be corrected. And so we talk about um, you know, not being a policer during conversations. That's one of the skills that we go over. Um, I'll show you guys an example of how we teach our teens to start a conversation with their peers, as well as how to exit conversations. And we actually teach them three different ways to exit a conversation. Again, we're providing them a roadmap, right? We don't say, if you're not interested, just go ahead and leave. We say, you know, if you join a conversation, um, you may never be accepted. You could do everything right, but they may never accept you for whatever reason. In that case, you want to exit the conversation by, by looking, turning, and walking away all in the same direction, right? We also say sometimes you might join a conversation, you might be initially accepted, but then excluded. So this happens to all of us where they'll invite you in, but then they'll um, kind of kick you out of the conversation by saying whatever, and they turn their body, right? We've all experienced this. And the strategies are a little bit different because you can't just walk away at that point because they have talked to you, they've, they've acknowledged you. So in that case, you actually have to give us a brief cover story for leaving. You have to give a reason for leaving because if you just walk away, They'll notice you walked away and they'll think, well, where did she go? Well, you know, that, that was kind of weird, right? So a brief cover story might be something like, gotta go, right? See you later, brief cover story. And then we talk about if you're fully accepted into a conversation, how do you exit that conversation? In that situation, you gave a more specific cover story. So you can't just say see ya to your friends because they might be confused. They'll say, where are you going, right? So in that case, you say, oh, my ride's here, I gotta go to soccer, you know, I have tutoring now. You give a more specific cover story. So we, we as much as possible, we try to break down these um, various scenarios, and again, these concrete rules and steps. We talk about electronic communication, which is um, the, I would say the most prominent way that teens are communicating these days, right? So we go over rules related to texting, Snapchat, whatever it is that they're using, how to use it safely if they choose to. 
Um, we also go over um, uh, uh, rules regarding um, telephone skills. And I know it's a dying art, and our teens always make a point to tell us that. But at this point, there's still no form of technology to replace um, a telephone. So we still go over those strategies. Um, we talk about get-togethers, which really is the strongest and best way to strengthen a friendship. And that's hanging out with your peers outside of school, outside of clubs. So it's really hanging out with your friends outside of those pre uh, prearranged settings. And um, for our young adult group, we go over dating eti etiquette. Um, we go over how to let somebody know that you like them, um, how to ask somebody out on a date, so how to flirt with them, how to ask them out on a date, as well as how to organize a date, um, general do's and don'ts when it comes to dating, um, how to take no for an answer, so how to accept rejection, um, as well as how they can politely turn somebody down if they don't want to date them. Right? Um, that's a running theme through our program is friendship is a choice. And dating is a choice, meaning I don't, get, uh, I don't get to be friends with everybody, but also not everybody gets to be friends with me, right? So really our teens and young adults start to um, get to choose who their friends are. When it comes to managing conflict and rejection, we go over the skills related to handling arguments, so how you can resolve an argument to be able to sustain that friendship, uh, how to handle verbal teasing and embarrassing feedback, as well as how to manage chronic bullying. Now for our teen group, we focus on physical bullying. Um, in our adult group, we don't focus on physical bullying, um, but we do talk about you know if, if people are, um, uh, being, um, if, they're, if it's more like workplace bullying or classroom type bullying that happens. Uh, we talk about what to do if you're the, the target of rumors and gossip, um, as well as how to handle cyberbullying. And we go over the strategies for changing your reputation, if that's something that you want to do. And for our adult group, we go over the strategies related to handling peer pressure. So how to say no, for example, if your friends are pressuring you to do something that you don't want to do, whether it's alcohol, drugs, staying out past your curfew, whatever it is, um, how to say no to your friends, but still be able to maintain that friendship. Okay. So I'm gonna go over a clinical example, and um, this is actually where I would love to have you guys participate. Um, so what are most teens told to do when um, trying to meet a new group of people? What are well-intentioned adults um, oftentimes telling teens to do to go meet new, uh, go meet new people? What do we say? What do we say? But how do you join a group? Right, but then once you get there, we say how do you then talk to those people? What do we say? We say hi, right? Can you imagine being a teen, going up to your group and just saying hi, right? Or hi, I'm Mina. What are they going to do? They're gonna stare at you, and they're gonna think you're weird, right? But we're giving them this advice. Um, so it's really important that we give them the right advice. So what are other teens doing to join these conversations, okay? Now let's also think about what are the common social errors made by teens with ASD when they're trying to join group conversations? What do they tend to do? They'll barge right in, right? And when they barge right in, what do they talk about? Right, their restricted interests. So it's really important that we go over not only what to do, but also what not to do. So we, again, introduce all of our skills by typically doing a role play first. So we never give them the skills. We want them to be part of the process. It's very organic. And so we say, watch this. And in this situation, um, tell us what Yasmin is doing wrong to enter this conversation. Um, and so then we'll say, great, time out. Tell us, what did Yasmin do wrong trying to join that conversation? And they'll let us know. They can point it out when other people are doing it, but it's hard for them to kind of catch themselves in the moment, right? And so that's why really that practice is so important. All right, um, so then we will, um, so then we'll, after each role play, bad and good, we'll ask them perspective taking questions. Because we, really we really want to strengthen their um, perspective taking skills, right? So we'll ask them, so I'm asking you guys too, what was that like for the group? when Yasmin tried to just barge in. What was that like for the group? Awkward, right? They'll say annoying. What did the group think of Yasmin? Yeah, weird. That's what they'll say, they'll say weird, right? And will the group want to talk to Yasmin again? Probably not. We ask them the same three questions after every single role play because we really want them to start thinking about their interactions in this way, right? 
So after we do a bad role play, then from there, um, we take the information that they provide us about what, what they did wrong, and then we provide the skills of what to do. So we'll say, you guys are right. We shouldn't be barging into conversations. Um, instead, what we should first do is we should watch and listen, right? So what are we doing? We're watching from a distance, but we don't want to make it obvious that we're watching or, or eavesdropping, right? So we say, have a prop. We all look at our, our phone when we're looking at something, right? We'll, we'll look at our phone. We might like look up again and we'll look back down. We all do this. If you're at school, you can pull out a book, for example. But you want to have a prop as you're watching, and we want them to be listening. Um, and what they're really listening for is a topic and seeing if they can identify any of those common or mutual interests. You know, we want them to assess, oh, can I join this conversation and meaningfully contribute to it? If not, I probably shouldn't be joining that conversation. We want them to make periodic eye contact, so look up once in a while from their prop. Um, and, and we say, if you know somebody in that group, it makes it easier to join that conversation. Why? Why is it easier if you're kind of familiar with somebody in that group? Connection, yeah, they vouch for you. We do clarify, though, if it's somebody that you have a bad reputation with, you don't want to join that group. Again, we do a lot of clarifying in our groups, OK? And then we say you also want to make sure that they're talking nicely. So if they're arguing, you probably don't want to join that group. Because, or if they're being mean to each other, you probably don't want to join that group because most likely they'll be mean to you, too. Okay? So once you've watched and listened and you decided, you know, I want to join this group. I know what they're talking about. I can talk about it, too. Then we say you actually have to wait. So you can't just join. You still have to wait for some type of pause or some type of acknowledgment. Now, if you're waiting nearby a group, people will sometimes notice you and they'll look at you. That's a great time to join the group, too. And then we say when you join, you want to move closer, but you're still about an arm's length away. You're not completely joining the group. Because if you're still about an arm's length away, if you need to exit the conversation, it makes it that much easier to do. Right? And then we say you join by making an on-topic comment, question, or complimenting them on whatever they were talking about. So if they're talking about their new phone, you can compliment them on their new phone, for example. Right? So do you guys, thinking about your interactions, do you guys do this too when you're joining conversations? You guys will notice this. Um, you'll start to break down interactions in this way. So now let me show you the right way to join a conversation. All right. So then we do repetition of instruction, and we say, OK, so what did Yasmin do right this time in joining the conversation? We have them identify those steps, right? Again, it's very repetitive, but that's the level of repetition needed for them to really take in the information. And if they say all of them, we'll say, great, which ones? And we have them tell them um, which skills they were. And again, we follow through with those perspective taking questions, right? So um, what was that like this time for the group when Yasmin followed the steps? What do you guys think they'll say? They'll say fine. They're not going to say it was great, right? But it was fine. It wasn't, she wasn't disrupting. Uh, she wasn't interrupting them. Um, what do you think the group thought of Yasmin? They'll say, OK, she was fine. She was cool. She seemed cool, right? Do you think they'll want to talk to her again? Maybe, probably. It's definitely not a no, which was the, the case for the first time, right? So again, we're just helping them to enter these conversations in um, a seamless way. So let me move on to a young adult example. So let's talk about dating. Um, we, only, we have three weeks that we spend on dating in the young adult group. Um, so what are most people with ASD told to do, or you know, anybody told to do, to let somebody know that you like them romantically? What type of advice do we give to people? Nobody wants to say. <laughs> OK. So well, what do you guys think? What are people told to do? To start talking to them, say you like them or you might be interested in them, right? Hang out where they're hanging out, right? Um, what do you think people with ASD are often, what they often do um, to let somebody know that they like them? They'll just tell them, right? I like you. Or they won't say anything and they'll think that person is their partner because of that perspective taking, right? They, they're thinking, well, I like you, so then I'm going to assume that you like me too. So we need to break things down for them. Um, and so if we go over how to flirt. We teach our young adults how to flirt, and this is really fun. Um, and um, what we do is we say, when you flirt, I know you guys are all laughing because we all do this. Um, you said we first make eye contact, right? So you look at somebody, right? You look at somebody, you give a slight smile, and we do, again, clarify. You don't want to give a big smile. You don't want to show a lot of teeth. Why not? 
very aggressive, right? So we say, just give a very slight smile, and then we say, so you look, you slight smile, then you look away, right? And then what do you have to do? Repeat it, right? So you have to look back at the person. The reason why you have to repeat is because if we did it just once, it might have been a coincidence, right? But if you do the repeat and they're also looking at you, it's more likely that they're also interested in you too, right? Um, this is really fun to do because we actually have them do this with our coaches. So we'll have um, both a male or female coach and we'll let them choose which coach they want to use to practice the skills. And they'll actually practice flirting uh, with one of our coaches. All right. Um, we say another way to let somebody know that you like them is to speak to a mutual friend. Um, and I know this seems very junior high, high school-ish, but we all still do this. Uh, meaning, um, you know, pick a mutual friend and ask if that person is dating anybody. Right? Are they seeing anybody? You might want to ask if they're interested in you. Um, if they might go out with you, you might casually mention that you like them. But we always end by saying, but don't tell them I said anything. But you know your mutual friend is going to go to that friend and say something, right? So there's a formula to all of this. So again, not only do you flirt, but you want to speak to a mutual friend. You can also give compliments, but the types of compliments have to be specific. So um, you want to. Um, so the way you compliment is very specific. And when you actually are getting to know somebody, we say um, you don't want to provide very specific comment, uh, compliments. Um, so you don't. So um, uh, sorry. You actually do want to give specific compliments for people you don't know well. So if they said a funny joke, you say, "Oh, that was a funny joke," or "That was really interesting." Um, but for people, um, once you've gotten to know them better, then you can provide more general comments like, oh, you're so funny, right? Oh, you're so smart. The reason why you want to be specific when you first know, um, when, you, when you don't know somebody quite well, is if you give a general comment, compliment, it might come across as being not very genuine. Or you're just kind of trying to win them over, right? So you want to be very specific at first. We say you do want to avoid giving a lot of physical compliments. And again, it gets around that perspective taking. It might make the person feel uncomfortable, right? Um, they might think you're interested in them only for um, a specific reason. So we say not too many physical compliments. And when you do give physical compliments, try to focus on neck up. <laughs> so we do clarify. All right. So how do you then ask somebody out on a date? This is how you do it. Um, first, you trade information with them. Right? So you're trading information. Um, you try to mention your common interests, see if they also are interested in those things. Um, and then you kind of casually ask what they're doing, um, maybe sometime this weekend, for example. If they seem interested, we say you want to use that common interest as a cover story to go out. Because if you were just to say, hey, do you want to go out? You want to go on a date? That, again, can be very um, aggressive or assertive, right? And it's also difficult to kind of save face if that person says no. Whereas if you're using a common interest as a cover story, um, it could have been that you were just asking just to hang out as a friend. Right? Um, if they are interested, then you would choose a general day and time to go out, exchange contact information, and then finalize those plans maybe like two days before the date. If they're not interested, we tell young adults to abort mission, right? You kind of keep your cool at that moment, casually say okay, and then you change the subject so it's not awkward. So for the dating etiquette, we just say practice if you're actually interested in somebody. Don't go out and just start practice dating and flirting with everybody. Because <laughs> some of them are so eager, they'll just start flirting with random people. <laughs> okay. All right, um, so let's get into the evidence base of our program. And by the way, that was um, Dr. Logason. She's a co-developer of the Peers Intervention, um, as well as a director of the clinic. Um, so these are um, some of the studies that we've done, really looking at the effectiveness of the Peers Intervention. And so uh, the top two studies are looking at our adolescent group. Um, on the bottom uh, right side, or on the bottom side, we're looking at peers um, in the classroom setting, and this was um, deployed in a non-public school setting. <clears throat> and then we also have a study on um, the young adults. Um, we this, uh, we've also had some great collaborators, and on the top, it's um, at uh, Marquette with um, Dr. Van Ecke's group, and what they looked at is not only how social anxiety changes as um, a function of the peers' intervention, so they found that their teens actually decreased significantly in social anxiety um, upon, um, after going through the group, but as well, she found the first biomarker 
um, really looking at how, um, cha how there are changes um, in their EEG pre and post treatment. So that's been really exciting to see. And then we also have a study there where PEERS was um, translated into Korean and it's a cultural adaptation um, of PEERS in Korea. What I'm gonna do is present on our long-term follow-up study. Um, and this is really one of our uh, most exciting studies. And this, what this did is follow families one to five years after treatment. So we contacted families after they participated in our group. Um, and out of the 82 families that we reached, we were able to get information from 53 of those families. We did um, run some analyses and there were no differences in between the responder and non-responder groups um, in terms of the follow-up data. Um, the mean age at follow-up, and this is only for our teen group, was 17 and a half years. Um, and on average for our teen groups, um, the, the mean age is 14 years. So ninth grade, I'm 14 years old. And the average time to follow-up was about um, a little bit, like two and a half years. So um, what we're going to see here is time one is pre-intervention. Time two is post-intervention, so 14 weeks after the, the program. Um, after going through the program. And then time three is, again, about two years after they left the program. And what we're seeing here is improvement in their social, social skills. So here, um, greater scores uh, indicate better social skills. So we're seeing across the three time points, um, the teens are consistently increasing in their social skills, and all these uh, results were clinically significant. So they're going from the below average range to the average range in their social skills. When it comes to the problem behaviors, we're seeing similar results, um, but this time we want problem behaviors to go down. And what we see here is at pre-intervention at time one, they were just below the elevated range when it came to problem behaviors, and that has gone down across um, post-intervention and the follow-up time points. Again, this was all um, statistically significant. These are the subscales for the social skills um, domain. Um, and what you see here is, again, you want um, the scores to go up. It, in it indicates better social skills. So we're seeing them improve in cooperation, assertiveness, empathy, and self-control. Um, and then for internalizing, externalizing, which are those problem behaviors, we want to see those go down. And we're seeing um, that same trend um, um, across those two problem behavior subdomains. Now this is the SRS, it's, again that's a measure of social communication impairments. What we're seeing at time one is that our teens were in the severe range in terms of their social impairments, social communication impairments. At time two, they're in the mild to moderate range, right? Um, and at time three, they're staying in that mild to moderate range. So we're not you know, curing autism, but, we're, we're, but we are pulling them down from a severe to a mild moderate range in regards to their ASD symptoms. Um, and that was statistically significant. And when we're looking at the subscales, again, we're seeing um, um, a trend in that they are, again, improving in their social awareness, social cognition, communication, motivation, and autistic mannerisms um, that really gets to repetitive behaviors and restricted interests. And we're seeing all of that improve over the three time points. And when we look at their quality of the number of get-togethers, we're seeing at that time one, they're having about two get-togethers a month. Right? Um, at time two, so after the group, they're having about, per parent report, which is blue, parents are reporting about four get-togethers a month. Our teens are reporting about almost six get-togethers a month. And at time three, which is about two years after treatment, they're reporting four get-togethers a month. Now, I know that might seem low, but that is a significant increase from time one. But also at the end of groups, we recommend that our families continue to have one get-together a week, which is what they're doing. So they're following our recommendation. You guys might wonder in time two why, why, um, why there's a discrepancy between parent and teen report. We checked in with our teens and our teens said they were hanging out with their, their friends and not telling their parents, which is actually pretty cool. So we want to, um, to be seeing that, okay. Um, and then finally, this is just a measure that we use just to make sure our teens um, have learned the material. And um, what we see is that um, at time one, they were about 50-50 in knowing um, ecologically valid social skills. At time two, they learned about 80% of the material that we presented to them. And at time three, about two years, they still maintain about 70% of the information, which is actually great. 
Um, and it's not just because they were in our 14 week long program, right? We're a very short program. Um, it's really the parents. The, par the parents are continuing to social coach them to have get togethers and they're coaching them on all these different strategies and skills. So the parent piece, they, it really is the, um, the critical component um, of, this, of this intervention. Um, now just for other resources, um, for our peers clinic, we do run three groups. We run a lot of groups during the week. So we have our preschooler group on Tuesdays. Um, at this time, it's limited to children between the ages of four to six and only with ASD. For our adolescent groups, um, it's not by age necessarily, but more about social landscape. So it's for our teens who are in middle school and high school. So we have um, teens as young as 10 in that group, but also as old as 18 within one group. Um, and the reason why we can do that is that we tell our teens, you're not here to make friends with each other. We actually don't allow our teens to hang out with each other during the course of the program. We say, you're here just to learn the skills. If you guys want to hang out after the program is over, you guys can definitely do that. Um, and so we have an, um, an ASD specific group, but we also have a general clinic group for our adolescent group. So this is where we, we might see teens who um, have ASD but look more neurotypical. Um, and we also, um, in that group, we have teens with ADHD, depression, anxiety, or maybe no disorder, but they're just struggling socially. And then we have a young adult group, um, which um, we're serving young adults between the ages of 18 to 30. So you have to have graduated from high school to be in this group. Um, and um, even though it says it's limited to ASD, we actually take in young adults without an ASD diagnosis. So depression, anxiety, that's appropriate. In terms of those of you who are interested in training or using this intervention um, in your clinical work, um, this is a published manual, so you can purchase this manual. Um, but you may also there's also the school-based manual here that has all of our recent modifications that we've made. Um, but there's also a certified training, which you don't have to attend to use the manual, but it is available to you. Um, it's a three or four day long training that's held at UCLA. Um, we also have several um, training resource scholarships for those of you who maybe are interested in doing this as part of your dissertation or, or master's level research work. Um, you could apply for a research scholarship and we give about two to three um, for each training. So that's something to think about if you're interested. Um, and this is our school-based manual. I've talked about this a little bit. Um, again, for middle school, high school students, 16 weeks long. Um, and it's a daily lesson plan, but it's really flexible. So it depends on how you're able to implement it into your school setting. Um, and it is teacher facilitated, but parents can be involved um, if the teacher, if the parents were willing to maybe come to a separate group once a week. That, that would be ideally how peers would be implemented in the school setting. Um, again, we go over those friendship skills, peer conflict skills, and you have the comprehensive parent handouts. Um, and a newest, um, one of the newer uh, resources is this parent book, which is uh, a translation of our peers' manual that we use. And Dr. Loggison wrote this because there were some teens or families who weren't able to access our program because they lived too far away, um, but also because the teens were not motivated to be in the program. Now that is also what makes us different from other social skills groups out there, in that if the teen says they're not motivated or they're here because their parent's making them come, the school's making them come, their doctor is making them come, we actually do not allow them to join into the group. The teen has to say they're some, at some level motivated to either make new friends or change something in their friendships. So again, that's also why this program works. It's because we do have a motivated population that we're getting to work with. And they are a delight to work with when you get to work with such a motivated group of teens. Um, so in this parent book, we go over all the same strategies. There's a parent section, um, and it goes over the lessons um, as well as specific social coaching tips. And each parent section is followed by a section for teen or young adults to read. So it, it kind of breaks down the information a little bit more. Um, it goes over uh, various homework assignments that they want to practice. And at the end of the book, there's actually a companion DVD. So the DVD, the role play videos that you saw here, we, it's actually part of a DVD that's in that book. And so they can look, watch the skills and see what it looks like. Um, and this was also developed in conjunction with um, an app that we created, and that, that was part of our virtual coach research study. Um, the app is called FriendMaker, and we developed this app to see if having this extra level of support would be helpful to teens or young adults. Because oftentimes parents aren't there, nor should they be there when they're hanging out with their friends necessarily. Or if they're at school, they want to join a conversation and they forgot the skills, 
They can pull it up on their phone to see all the steps. If they're able to, they can watch a quick video. Um, so that's an extra resource. It's called FriendMaker. It's only available on Apple platform, but it's 99 cents. So it's a great resource to have um, for our teens and young adults. Okay. Um, so thanks for listening. If you have any questions, you can always contact um, our clinic there. Facebook's a great way. It helps to, I think, um, make us as a treatment team very human to our teens and young adults. And so if, you have, if you're interested in doing this, um, it's a great way to kind of get to know our clinic. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.